Live from the Washington, D.C. area, it's the Inside Scoop and Low Planet. All the ecology news that our viewers want to know. Now, here's your host, Executive Director of the Emerald Planet, Dr. Sam Lee Hancock. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States, looking around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for the thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And many of you know from uh, past programs, we talk about that the projection is 2 billion, that's correct, 2 billion new people on the planet by 2050. And many people say, how are we gonna take care of the 7 billion we already have here now? Well, regardless, uh, they're gonna be here. And we have a young man sitting next to me who's been thinking about this actually for uh, many years. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Joseph N. Pelton, he goes by the name of Joe. He's a co-author of a book, The Safe City, Living Free in a Dangerous World, New Ways to Urban and Cyber Security. And also, he's still a professor, but he's a retired dean from the International Space University in Europe. Joe, welcome to the Emerald Planet. Great to be back. Glad to have you here at all times. Well, as I've teased you before on the Emerald Planet about your 30 plus books that you've published and over 100 articles and you've been speaking everywhere on the planet, I believe. Well, what's driving you in this consistent effort towards looking at what they're now calling the meta city? Well, uh, in terms of writing books, uh, I was once told that uh, about one out of 50 books is a bestseller. So I figure if I get to 50, maybe I'll get a bestseller. <laughs> but uh, seriously, um, I've been blessed uh, in my career to uh, uh, be involved with setting up the International Space University, meeting a lot of key people around the world, perhaps most significantly Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, when we were uh, celebrating the anniversary of Intelsat, I got to meet him and go back and play ping pong with him and so on. And now tell he, us a little bit, who is this uh, Arthur C. Clarke? Well, Arthur C. Clarke is most known for uh, writing and producing the movie uh, 2001, The Space Odyssey, but he also first conceived the communication satellite, and uh, he uh, is a real visionary of the 20th century. And he really has inspired me to uh, try to take on some of these issues and do the research and uh, publish. And uh, uh, he was the uh, chancellor of the International Space University, so I got to work with him setting that up. And uh, the three I's of the International Space University are international, intercultural, and interdisciplinary. And, and I think this is something that really works well, Joe, with what you're doing as far as the challenges facing the planet. And I was just talking about we're going from 7 billion to 9 billion people projected by 2050. And there's a lot of changes that are coming, but this is something that you've been thinking about and you've been involved in the future society and you know numerous other groups. But how do you think that elected officials, uh, civil society uh, leadership, and others need to be really thinking about uh, the new meta city and this new urban paradigm. Right. Well, we are facing in the 21st century, I think, our greatest challenge in, in terms of the uh, human race, that uh, we're not only adding two billion people, but we're adding more people than that to our urban environment by 2050. Yeah, they're That's saying maybe as uh, over 80% right. of all the world's population will actually be on and in urban areas. Right, well we were at 3% just a few centuries back, and in fact uh, the total population of the world uh, in 1900 was 1 1.8 billion people and we're going to be adding more people to the world and even more people than that to our urban environment. And 80% of our new development in our urban areas, unfortunately, are going to be slums uh, that uh, have inadequate transportation, energy, education, health care, and that uh, this is going to create enormous challenges for us. And well, climate some, change on top of this is, compounds the issue. Yeah, and, and this is what we're seeing now as you look around the globe and number of protests in many of these developing countries that are, uh, have very youthful populations. Also, the uh, 
middle class is expanding at a very rapid rate. So the world, in many ways, is doing quite well as far as by people is concerned. But at the same time, the expectations are rising more and more all the time. So what are some of the potential strategies you see, Joe, as far as as we move forward in these uh, new urban areas? And the challenge, as we show here in this graphic of India, that almost lost all of its power. Yes, well, that was a, a huge event and basically shut down India. But uh, essentially what we're seeing is over-urbanization. Uh, my book, The Safe City, if I try to sum it up in a few words, is uh, urban sprawl is bad, urban density uh, is good, but super-urban density, uh, over-development uh, uh, of the core of the city is a problem and it's uh, creating enormous issues and that if we have a disaster of some sort, then the problem of dealing with that disaster is compounded. And in fact, the Home Minister of India who reviewed my book said, our first responders are unable to respond to a huge disaster with this uh, overdevelopment in the cores of our city. So we have invented what we call the meta city, uh, the concept of moving population uh, not out of urban areas, but moving them out of the very core of the city and using uh, technology like telecommunications so we don't have people going back and forth mm -hmm. during uh, the rush hour, uh, expending more energy, uh, generating more greenhouse gases and so on. So Yeah, you're talking really about the, uh, the telecommuting and looking, just keeping the slide that you uh, provided for us, Joe, and then go to this uh, next one here as far as the planet is concerned and the challenge of water is that uh, we really need to think critically about the resource base that we have. And I know this is something that you're actually looking at as far as a medicity. Right. So in looking at having striking this balance between, you know, having people in urban areas so they have the services but not having this extreme concentration, how do you plan for that and to allow nation states to really put that into not only their planning but also their budgets? Right. Well, first of all, it's very, very difficult. Uh, most of the migration to the urban areas is driven by the need for jobs, and uh, Chuck Vollmer is going to be talking about that issue. So we want these metacities to be integrated concepts that provide jobs, provide uh, urban amenities, but without stacking everybody inside of a major area. Uh, take the case of uh, NEC in Japan. They now have more than 60 telework centers and that they basically figured out that the cost of building new buildings for their employees in the heart of Tokyo cost too much money. Mm -hmm. So it's not only a, a plus in terms of transportation, in terms of energy consumption and the environment, but also it's a, a plus in terms of real estate costs and uh, other things. So we think the Medicity has many advantages to it. Uh, it's more secure, you have better transportation systems, uh, you have less energy consumption, and also uh, there's a problem we saw earlier about uh, water, uh, because water and food is a big part of this issue as well. Yeah, and this is one of the things that we've been looking at for quite a long time as far as Emerald Planet is to allow uh, families and also local communities to be independent in food, water, and energy. But looking at the role of government in this, uh, many times they're just trying to scramble to take care of what already exists and it's very difficult to plan, particularly in these developing nations with very young populations, the demands for education, K-12 and university and level, and then also your international bodies like the UN, World Bank, International Monetary Fund. So how do you involve all of them in these various organizations into this discussion and then actually have something happen? Right. Well, first of all, uh, have them read my book. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Indu Singh, who uh, is my co-author on this, uh, he actually travels around the world meeting with uh, ministers and other people uh, who are involved with the future planning of their countries. Uh, he's very much involved in Brazil, and he's basically saying creating these new uh, security systems for the uh, uh, upcoming Olympics and uh, the World Cup matches uh, make these systems count in terms of not only make them for 
uh, the security of the games, but make them multipurpose uh, platforms so that you can use them for education, use them for distributed health care, make them multipurpose, and also don't overdose on security. Uh, he uh, has noted that we have spent in the United States some $750 billion it's, on security. It's just incredible the amount of money that's been spent and if you listen to the experts now, they're saying the vast majority of it actually has just been wasted. Well, and I don't know wasted, but the point is, had it been invested uh, for security systems to protect us against earthquakes and uh, hurricanes and also multipurpose systems that could support education and health care, we could have leveraged that, uh, well, go, go, that three quarters of a trillion dollars and much more. Yeah, well that goes to the waste because right. it's gone into guns, bullets, and new cars right. instead of the types of things that uh, people are really saying they need, which again is education and jobs, health care. Right and the other basic and the infrastructure. <laughs> yeah, but looking at this uh, chart that you have here, we have uh, uh, less, almost about, about a minute left. Right. So uh, summarize what we right. got, take well, us through it. Basically, it's to try to say that you need a new vision, that we have ideas about things you can do in the near term, but basically we're saying you need a 40-year plan to make the adjustment to this huge uh, sea change that's coming in terms of urban areas. And we basically think that um, if you plan ahead, uh, I was involved in Arlington with the... That's uh, Arlington, the, Virginia, the Arlington, United Virginia, States. in the United mm -hmm. States, mm -hmm. where we had so-called smart growth. And in 40 years, we have put 85% of the people near transportation systems and so on, and uh, created what we consider kind of a version of the meta city in Arlington, Virginia. And we have just adopted and started a 40-year plan for energy to reduce our greenhouse gases, uh, to use telecommuting, and all of these new concepts that we're thinking about in terms of the meta city for the 21st century. Yeah, I know uh, you're looking at it uh, very much as a zero carbon footprint right. within Arlington. And uh, up on the screen now is uh, what the uh, planners uh, in Madrid are trying to do in terms of their concepts of a meta city, working with uh, Pe Pedro Ortiz, who is in charge of this for the World Bank, who's trying to uh, get the message out that we really need to do new ways of urban planning. Well, uh, Dr. Joseph N. Pelton, the co-author of The Safe City, Living Free in a Dangerous World, New Ways to Urban and Cyber Security. It's always good to have you with us, and thank you for sharing your uh, thoughtful insight. You'll be back again, so we're, we're not getting rid of you. But anyway, I just wanted to say that it's, it's really interesting and exciting to learn that we actually are planning as we move towards 2050 and the Emerald Planet. This is firstgov.gov, where we're obsessed with getting you government information. Brand new student loan applications on the site, baby. This calls for a celebration. Here's your uncle. So in the end, it was either take the astronaut gig or come work here. What can I say? Duty called. Dude, that's my cop. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm pretty sure that's Sam's cop. Oh, sorry? Yeah. No. Sam's? No. Just log on or email us and get what you need. C, change of address form. That's how it's done. D, driver's license renewal. E, uh, e. emailing social security information. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice, we'll allow it. All right, Ed. What are those? Government surplus cars for auction. You posted those online last time. No, you did. I'm posting them online this time. For all your government information, firstgov.gov. Oh, what have we got here? Sometimes you feel tired. You can't seem to lose those extra pounds off your midsection. And your joints hurt when you take the stairs. Well, you're getting older. But I'm happy to say that there's some simple things we can do to keep you happy and healthy for years to come. We can also lower your risk for some serious diseases the older population is often subject to. Proper nutrition is more important than ever. Your body has changed, you know. Not as many treats. A basic exercise plan. Lots of walks and fresh air. And most importantly, come and see me for twice yearly checkups to help ensure the best possible quality of life. Now, how does that sound? <laughs> Good boy. 
Improve the quality of life for your elderly pet. Schedule twice yearly checkups that include preventive care and regular lab work. A message from the veterinary members of the American Animal Hospital Association. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet. Come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look at for the thousand best practices, the technologies, the services, and the products, as well as the people are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And we're looking at the discussion of how we're going to take care of the Two billion new people are going to be joining us on the planet, going from seven to nine billion souls. And uh, looking at the quality of life, all those issues that we need to concern ourselves. I have uh, Edward M. Johnson, goes by Eddie. Uh, he's an architect with the AIA, uh, ALSA, Landscape Architect. Noma, he's also an interior designer, and he's the present architect at Edward M. Johnson and Associates. And um, I like all these titles, Eddie. That's uh, very impressive. Urban planner as well. <laughs> but I tell you, what is really impressive, the work you've been doing for almost uh, four decades now, is, the, is looking at taking urban areas, but keeping that natural environment and it bringing nature into the buildings. Tell us a little bit about the philosophy of your own organization, and then we're going to move to this concept of the metacities. Okay. I started a firm in 1969 named the Organization for Environmental Growth. I saw then that if we're going to maintain and improve the quality of life, we must pay attention to air, water, transportation, and the built environment. And so therefore we created this entity which allowed us to provide all of these services, landscape architecture, architecture, interior design, urban planning transportation planning under one roof. We expanded that over time into health-related issues as well. Well, I think it's absolutely fantastic. And, and that was the perfect segue. It was going to be my next question. Because this whole balance of designing buildings, designing the urban core, the urban areas, so that actually before anything is ever done, before the first spade of dirt is moved, as we're looking at how we're going to improve, not just guard, but improve, the health, but also the environment within that urban area. How do you do that to make sure that it happens and then get the developers to incorporate that actually into the cost structure for the project? Well, architects are very unique. We are the sole entity responsible for planning and designing the human environment, the places where people live, work, recreate, worship, where we participate in cultural affairs, we create that environment. And in order to do so successfully, we need to recognize after oxygen, then oxygen, air, and water are the most important features and that influence our lives. So in order to preserve the quality of the built environment as we change it from plants, trees, grass. We need to preserve these trees. This process of removing toxins from the air, the carbon monoxides and the carbon dioxides, is called stomata. The process of releasing the oxygen into the air is called transpiration. So everything we do, we're conscious of keeping trees, keeping plants. That is so important, plus the fact that you get natural drainage. So as architects begin to change the natural environment to developing facilities, the more we pay attention, the more we preserve our own health and lives. Well, I think this is something that's important that uh, architects are working with engineers or working with developers and investors, but at the same time, they have to be cognizant that this really is our planet. It really is our environment within which we're living. So as we add two billion new souls to the planet by 2050, and then we have almost 80% of all these people living in urban areas along the coastal uh, ocean areas uh, and, and countries all over the globe, 
How do you combine all these things, these skills, being the architect, the landscape architect, interior design, and urban planning, all four of those, so that we actually have this in advance, again, before anything ever starts? Well, it has to be an in-house, initially an in-house coordinated effort. But beyond that, we have to work with the various government municipal officials, the Office of Planning, Department of Transportation, Health, etc. And we encourage government to make changes to the zoning laws which regulate development and determines how much built environment can be created, how much building can be created on a particular parcel of land and such that so that as developers pursue projects with a primary interest of profits, we need more more changes to the zoning regulations that requires private developers to maintain a certain amount of open area wherever they build across the planet. One of the issues with megacities is limiting a city to a 10 million, uh, 10 million person growth and also to, oh, what's the word I want to use, to provide for 1% growth. And that's not happening in the megacities. People are migrating to cities all over the world because center cities have all of the facilities and conveniences and the employment centers and the recreational centers that are combined in a small area which allows people to move back and forth quickly. And it eliminates the need for massive transportation with the buses and the cars and the trucks which reduces toxins in the air and so forth. And so there's a tremendous challenge on the part of our legislators to make decisions that improve the quality of, of life. Part of that as well is we need to get more folks who are economists and urban planners and architects in the decision-making process. Now, I think that's very important. Also, talking about the uh, natural environment, as you know, as people go in, and I find this, uh, whether it's uh, in the United States or other countries around the globe, it's like they almost just scrape all of the, the topography, the plants, every living thing you know, from the, the scene and then they come back and try to recreate it. So looking at how do we protect, not just protect, but how do we enhance the air, the water, and the soil quality uh, through this uh, development process and the design, again, before we uh, even get started on this? Well, again, I go back to a point I just made, and that is we need a greater coordinated effort between planning officials, transportation officials, which are unique in the sense that we need an improved transportation system to provide for and improve urban development. And when we do that, we set in place a process, an improved process to improve the quality of life, life for all of those that are moving into, into cities everywhere. And part of that is encouraging the use of bicycles. As a matter of fact, one of the points that I've made to district officials here in, in the nation's capital recently, give people who ride bicycles to work a tax credit. That will reduce the number of cars and trucks on the road. Plus the fact that they'll improve the quality of health because they're riding a bike. Well, and also the same time is that they're reducing the amount of right. uh, CO2 right. carbon release in the air and right. uh, far less uh, natural resources going into making a bicycle right. than uh, making a car. But looking at all the various institutions, I'm just looking at the kind of the list that I made here from my research at government agencies, international bodies like the UN, the World Bank, uh, funders, NGOs, non-governmental organizations. How do we earnestly include all of these different groups? Because development anymore is just not, doesn't stop at borders. So if you put a new power plant in India, or China, or uh, you're uh, taking rainforest out of Brazil, that affects the entire planet. And that's something that we need to be cognizant of as we move through the 21st century. Absolutely. And because we recognize at this point in, in the growth of, our, of, the world, of the planet that we're having serious problems with our air, more and more industries are beginning to recognize they need to take leadership positions to, to, to institute changes here. For example, we have solar energy as a uh, source of uh, reducing carbon, uh, the carbon footprint across the planet. Uh, th there's a, another uh, product that I'm aware of called supertherm insulation, which is a coating that reduces the heat requirements of buildings by 70%. It's sanctioned by the American Institute of Architects, the Pentagon, mm -hmm. the, uh, the uh, uh, U.S. Green Building Council, and so forth. So as industry begins to recognize that technology exists in so many areas 
that allows us to make decisions, wise decisions, cost effectively to improve the quality the quality of the environment, it's going to happen more and more. I think, Eddie, this is something that we've talked about because you've been on Emerald Planet in the past and we talked about uh, energy uh, conservation of buildings, increasing the insulation that you have, uh, reducing the demand on the grid, actually having distributive uh, power systems where buildings are actually generating a part of maybe all of their their own power needs within the building. Uh, what, what is that, how does that impact the cost? How does that impact the developers? Because I hear from a uh, number of designers that actually can reduce the long-term cost of the building and increase the profitability of these structures. Well, if we begin to invest more in solar energy and more in supertherm coatings, for example, more in, geot uh, uh, more in, in, in uh, um, uh, processes that reduce the use of, of coal, the use of oil, it, it obviously is going to save money. Uh, geothermal heat, which is mm -hmm. extracting heat from the earth. And these systems are developed such that in certain areas people are able to give money back to the local municipality because they're not using energy sources other than energy sources from the earth. So more and more technology is being applied to how do we save money? We only have so much earth and so much air and so much water. And we have really serious problems with our air and water. So we need to spend more time. For example, the nation's capital is investing millions in improving its, its sewage system and its drinking water. And as I mentioned earlier, a after air, water is the most important substance we put in our body. So we have to be careful with how we improve the quality of the water that we're using. And part of this process is encouraging the population across the planet to use less for, for substances and uses outside of it's needed for health. Yeah, well looking at, uh, we only have about uh, 40 seconds left, so it's gotta be quick. What do you see over the next five, 10, 15 years as we move forward to develop these meta cities around the globe to handle this influx, this increase of uh, new persons on the planet? Well, one, planners have to begin looking at what kind of decisions can be made to improve the quality of human health. We've got a health crisis here in America with the incidence of, incidence of heart, uh, high blood pressure, yeah, 20 cancer, seconds. et cetera. Architect, architects need to use their experiences to look at what can we do, what kind of decisions we can make to improve the quality of health with, with uh, design features in, in buildings and sites. Well, uh, Edward M. Johnson, who uh, has a long list of titles and uh, has four certifications in all types of uh, architectural design, but president and architect for Edward M. Johnson Associates in Washington, D.C. And thank you for sharing with us about how we can design buildings and the urban areas as we look forward to creating the Emerald Planet. Too many women get hit by their boyfriends and husbands. Too many women are pressured into having unprotected sex. Half of the people in the world living with AIDS are women. It doesn't have to be this way. Together, we can change this reality. Let's strive for a world free of violence. At Volunteers of America, we don't just give kids a way to stay off the streets. We give them the tools they need to reach their full potential. We don't just help the elderly receive needed care. We help them live life to the fullest. We don't just provide food for homeless individuals and families. We provide job training and placement so they can buy groceries. Volunteers of America is a national organization that for over a hundred years has provided programs and services that allow people to overcome their challenges to become vital members of their community. At Volunteers of America, we don't just help people, we help people help themselves. Find out how you can support the programs that are working in your community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089. Drivers face all kinds of distractions. Guys, 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 stop, stop playing, no? Before your wireless phone becomes one of them, stop. 
Drive safely. Keep your phone in easy reach and dial sensibly. In bad weather or traffic, call later and use a hands-free device. Remember, with wireless, safety is your call. To the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States, looking around the globe in 144 different nations, looking for those thousand best practices that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And we have a gentleman with us that's a part of the people of this whole process. Uh, Chuck D. Vollmer is the uh, founder and author of what's called Jobonomics, a plan for America, 20 million new jobs by 2020. Chuck has been with us before, but uh, Chuck's here uh, wearing a little different hat tonight because we're going to be uh, furthering our conversation about metacities and how his Jobonomics plan and the purpose of Jobonomics is really fitting in and dovetailing with this movement towards the uh, meta cities, which are catching on and are uh, being built in a number of different countries around the globe. So, Chuck, welcome back. Thank you. Glad to have you here. Now, Jobonomics, we've talked about that before, but uh, what is Jobonomics? Uh, let's uh, refresh the uh, memory of our viewers here, but also how does this term really fit in the contemporary society as we're really moving towards 2050? Well, Jobonomics was a uh, written uh, book that I wrote, so it's a book, but it's also uh, the uh, a grassroots movement. We've reached out to about two million people. Uh, we have uh, uh, I've got a number of organizations in different cities, but our objective is during this decade is create 20 million new private sector jobs by that, 2020. That's the, that sounds absolutely incredible. And actually, I did, a, did some uh, research on the numbers of that. So people are excited if we have about 125,000 jobs on a month-to-month -month basis. And what you're talking about is 264,410 uh, new jobs per month as we go towards January of 2020. And, uh, but you actually have a plan to do that. And this is why, you know, why aren't politicians and uh, civil society developers and planners really looking at this as a way to move past and double the number of jobs and, and new enterprises that are being created. Well, I think uh, it, in today's environment, politicians tend to uh, steer the ship by looking at the wake or looking in the rearview mirror. Uh, the number you need is, as you said, is $250,000 uh, 250, jobs a, a, a month. And there you get that number, if you, for example, if uh, in the past, uh, in the decade, in the 90s, the 80s, we did about 20 million jobs, so there's a historical precedent. But we have about 16 million people entering the workforce every year, and if we wanna get the unemployment rate down to full employment around below 6%, that's 20 million jobs. So you divide that number, so you need about 250,000 jobs a month. But people don't understand the macro part of it, so they're happy when we're creating 80, 90, 150,000 jobs, but we're actually getting deeper and deeper in the hole. Yeah, looking at that. Now, going to the MetaCity, you know, this is what we're here to talk about tonight. We have uh, Dr. Joe Pelton that's with us. It's a world-renowned uh, author and researcher. And then uh, Eddie Johnson, who's uh, working on this uh, health and, and nature as far as uh, urban design and all that. But without jobs, we can't pay for any of this. And so jobs really is at the core of what it is we're doing for these new meta cities. So as we're looking towards creating these new urban areas, how do we fix the job so that it's just, you know, without thinking, it's just part of the, the conversation and we move on to create these new jobs? Well, there's two parts of the questions. I don't know if you have the uh, chart. I the, sure do. Uh, uh, Joe said in his book, and it's a great book, I recommend it to everybody, He's, he talks about uh, by 2030, uh, there's going to be 75% of the people in the world living in urban areas. In the United States, we're already there. If you look at the chart behind us, in 1810, uh, we had about 6%. Most of the people lived on the farms and the ranches. Then we went through the Industrial Revolution, and by 1910, 45%. And today, 81% of the people lives in, in the cities. 
So if you ask me from a job economics perspective, are our mega cities, meta cities, meta being after our concept, the future cities, or is the future city of America sustainable? And our answer is no. No. Oh, okay. So that's the uh, the short answer. Okay. Looking at uh, this whole thing, how do we make the uh, urban areas to be sustainable? Because without sustainability, you, all you're doing is really just stacking people that become even more and more miserable and less access to the resources they need. Well, you, you see that all, all the inner city. We work in most of the inner cities in Jobonomics, and that's, that's uh, one of our three major demographics. Uh, the slide you have up now is since the year 2000, uh, four times as many people have left the workforce that have entered the workforce in the United States. Can you say that again? Since the year 2000, four times as many people have left the U.S. workforce than has entered it. And that tends to be oriented in the inner cities and the urban areas. Yeah, that's a very shocking uh, statistic. So yeah, we'll, the other we'll thing is that there. the governments now, uh, they, people in the inner cities or in the urban areas, and there's urban the inner cities and suburban. And by the way, suburban areas are becoming the newer poor because they were built on double income families. And now with the joblessness and that type of thing, mm -hmm. they are becoming the new poor as well. So if we look at the 81% in the urban areas, the, the people are looking to either government or industry supply those jobs. Well, government at the federal, state, and local level with the budget deficits, and we're already spending a trillion dollars more a year than, we're, than we take in, so that largesse is, is gonna run out. Then they look at industry, and uh, the Fortune 500 hasn't added one new net job in the last three decades because manufacturing has gone to other out overseas and that type of thing. So it's our position that U.S. urban areas are not sustainable, but they can be made sustainable, and I'd like to address that. Okay. Well, looking at that, we, you have those uh, four pillars as far as the, the areas of uh, creating new jobs. I know you've laid that out for us in the past, but I think we probably ought to go back and look at that again because that goes really to the heart of this meta mm -hmm. city because if we're not creating new jobs, then there's going to be no uh, new net creation of these uh, these new uh, urban areas. Well, the four, four areas where you can get jobs, you can get small business, you can get large business, you can get foreign-owned business, and you have government business, you know, graded jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, our plan, the 20 million new private sector jobs by 2020, 80% is in small businesses. What we show on this slide that you have up on the screen is today 77% of all businesses are small business in the United by employment. As a matter of fact, the very micro businesses from one to 19 employees uh, employ 29.4 million people, whereas the big companies, the thousand plus, only do about 18 million. Uh, the other thing that I think people uh, are, are very interested, uh, uh, say that is, is a falsehood, that you flip the next slide. Okay. This comes from uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics and uh, the ADP. People say that small business fail at a greater rate than large business. If you look at the graph, the line at the top are for micro businesses. And this is since the recession. You can see the dip in the recession. The bigger companies, the medium-sized companies took a bigger dip and they haven't recovered as quickly as small businesses. Now small businesses, you know, we, we, we talk about is, you know, uh, micro business, self-employed businesses, uh, emerging businesses, a home-based business and that type of thing. And we think that there are three major demographics that we need to go after, which in of themselves can create these 20 million new jobs. Okay, well looking at, I'm gonna leave this slide up because I, this really, I think, Chuck tells a story about what we're uh, talking about here. But uh, looking at these uh, new meta cities, what do we need to do as far as the companies, individuals, local government, state government, uh, and NGOs to be able to adopt the jobonomics so that now it's more than a book, it's a public movement, all these things you and I have been talking about over the last few years, to really it's actually incorporated into public policy and we have jobs as one of the main focuses along with the infrastructure development and all the civil society things that we need to accommodate these two billion new people coming yeah. on. Yeah. Now, I focus mainly in America. Of course. Now, of course, I just came back from Mexico City and other places. 
And we say that we ought to look at us as a bellwether, since we're already at 81% and seeing what we're going to go do. If you look at Joe's book, he's got about 12 points. Now, we really emphasize his eighth point about jobs creation. Uh, from our viewpoint, you've got to have security, because if, you, if you're not safe, you're not going to get anything done. But we tell the mayors is that you need to focus not on jobs, but business. Jobs don't create jobs. Businesses create jobs. Mm -hmm. And since 80% of the, small, uh, the jobs you have are small businesses, and they've been leached over the last decade because they're not getting funding, we're putting all the money in stimulus and government jobs, the, the, uh, the, uh, the shovel-ready jobs or the uh, manufacturing and that type of thing where if we put that amount of money or a decent percentage or even a small percentage into small business creation, that that's what they, they need to do. And, and we look at three really areas. We have uh, areas and demographics for, for Gen Y, the 20 year olds, mm -hmm who don't want careers like you and I. Mm -hmm. They're interested in self-employed business, home-based businesses. And we have a program uh, we call MetroCore, where we're with a number of IT uh, uh, professionals looking at the next generation internet. In other words, how do you monetize the social networks? If you can monetize the social networks, the 20 year olds will figure out, and think of eBay and those types of things. And the United States is blessed because we've got all the biggies. We've got Microsoft, we've got Amazon, we've got Facebook, we have all the Googles the, of the, the world. Google, right? Googles of the world, and to be able to monetize through broadband, we can do it as, as, as Joe and Eddie were saying, we could do it in home, reduce the transportation costs just in the urban areas. The second area that we think we need to emphasize is women-owned businesses. We're not talking about women in business, but women-owned businesses. Uh, women, for example, uh, are you know, on the maternal side. Uh, by 2020, the baby boomers like in you and I will be 17 million uh, daycare beds short for the baby boomers by 2020. That, you could create about a, a 10 million new jobs or even home-based self-employed in just in elder care. Then if you add in uh, health care, you add in uh, child care. And the third area that we need to emphasize is in particularly the inner cities. We're working in the inner city of Detroit, New York, uh, Washington, Atlanta. And in some of those areas, like Detroit, is really a, a really tough case. I mean, downtown Detroit, it's so bad that the police are not even responding to a lot of 9-11 calls. Yeah. So, the, what we're doing in that is, we've talked before, is how do I monetize um, the waste streams? And we've come up with some technologies of how we can process electronic waste and those type of things and create a revenue stream for the inner cities up to about $100 million a year. I think that's absolutely fantastic. And uh, Chuck, as always, we've totally run out of our time. But uh, thank you for sharing with us. I'm going to leave this uh, slide up as uh, uh, we leave uh, Emerald Planet for this particular segment. But the whole thing is that we have to look at new ways of involving the youth, involving uh, women to create new jobs and to make uh, new opportunities. And thank you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. Around the world, one out of every three women will be beaten or otherwise abused in their lifetime, often by a family member or loved one. A future free from violence. It's all she's ever wished for. Did you know you have the power to stop children from joining gangs? You can help a father find a job and home for his family. You can assist a woman who can't afford the medicine she needs to live and the home she can't live without. You can choose to make a difference in our community. Support Volunteers of America and you can help improve the lives of nearly 2 million Americans each year with programs and services that help individuals and families overcome their challenges to become as independent as possible. Support the programs that are working in our community. Contact Volunteers of America today. Call 1-800-899-0089.
For some folks, saving for the future is easy, but for you, it might take a little more effort. Saving for your future is your responsibility, and there's a lot to save for. I never thought of that. Like your child's education, perhaps uncovered medical expenses, or just to be sure you can live the way you want when you retire. The time is now to save for tomorrow. Save now or work forever. The choice is yours. Choose to save. We're back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you from Washington, D.C. in the United States. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the President and Executive Director of Emerald Planet and the Emerald Planet TV. We have four outstanding individuals that are meeting with us to talk about the meta-cities and how we're going to accommodate two billion new people on the planet by 2050. And many people are saying is that we can't take care of the numbers of people that we have here right now but uh, these new folks are going to be coming regardless or not. And uh, these gentlemen have been uh, working on this and uh, trying to decide how we actually move the planet forward. I have sitting uh, next to me is Dr. Joseph N. Pelton. He's a co-author of uh, Safe uh, City. And I won't go into the whole long uh, title there, Joe, because we've talked about this before. But uh, he is uh, the former dean and professor at the International uh, Space uh, University over in uh, Europe. Uh, Eddie, or Edward M. Uh, Johnson, who is the uh, architect and uh, president of his own uh, architectural firm and has uh, multiple titles uh, to his name. And then uh, Chuck Vollmer, who is the uh, author and founder of Jobonomics. And this is all about creating 20 million new jobs by 2020. And I'm going to start off with Joe. Joe, we've been talking about the meta cities you've been on before. Define just briefly what is a meta city? Well, it is, if you will, the next generation of thinking about urban design. And uh, the big problem in many of the mega cities that are growing out of control, well above the uh, uh, 10 uh, million level that Eddie uh, referred to. Uh, Lagos is headed toward 40 million people. I know some of these cities are already 30 million and growing. Well, the, you have the Canton area of, of China where that the peninsula is basically all an urban area that's uh, going toward 100 million people. These are unsustainable levels. So clearly you have to address the population issue because even with all the green technology, we can't really sustain ourselves at that kind of population growth. Uh, Eddie mentioned 1% growth. Uh, India, for instance, is growing a net 1.5% a year. That's unsustainable. Uh, there are lots of other countries that are going 5 6%, which is totally uh, unsustainable. But there are different approaches in different areas. In, in, uh, Singapore, for instance, uh, they put in a new tax system. So if you had one child, uh, you got a tax deduction. You have two children, you lose the tax deduction. And if you have more than two children, you pay a penalty. You start paying uh, to, the, to the state itself. Eddie, looking at the work that you've done, and we've talked about this before, but you've been consistent over almost uh, the last 35 years, is that to make a sustainable uh, city, we have to protect the environment but also to enhance uh, quality of air and water and soil. So as we move to these, uh, these new cities that are, you know, 10, and Joe was talking about 100 million uh, in a uh, uh, megaglopolis, and then you have some cities in Africa spreading across three countries, so they're no longer even within the boundaries of their own nation state. How do you see uh, the professionals, and I'm the broad range of professionals, that can be involved now so that we're prepared before we get to 2050 and these two billion new people are with us on the planet already? Well, over time, I've recognized that the land development process is one of the most important sources of economic development in the world because during the planning process, it buys lots of contracts and jobs. During the construction process, we all know various kinds of diverse jobs are, and contracts are generated. 
And when these projects are finished and occupied, they require a lot of contracts to subsidize them. Now, because there's such a, a momentous move to urban areas throughout the world, our leadership should change the policies, zoning uh, regulations, and building codes to require that developers invest a percentage of their profits in the infrastructure, which is water, sewerage, and the preservation of the natural landscape. For example, the zoning regs could be changed to say 15% of the site must be retained for natural landscaping. And when our officials, in a coordinated fashion, in an integrated coordination, coordinated fashion with private industry, that is the architects and the urban planners like us, and their own elected officials, when we have an integrated process to make decisions about how we encourage development, because at a time we, we had to give uh, incentives to get developers to come into our urban areas, but now because there's such a massive growth in urban areas, we don't need to do that anymore. We need to leverage more to support urban development, that is to, for the preservation of, of the environment and the improvement of the health of those folks who are moving into the urban well, areas. Well, Chuck, as the, uh, the founder and author of uh, Jobonomics, if you could just give us a quick uh, brief uh, overview of what Jobonomics is, but really going to the core of the, the meta-city as we are creating all this new infrastructure, we're putting in the roads, the health care, education, and all that, but we're not really looking at it from the standpoint of the number of jobs that we can create within that area so that people actually are sustainable and at the same time allowing people to uh, be more involved in what is going on around them. We hear this unrest around the globe and it's really it's all about jobs, it's about health care, education and allowing people to have a decent way of life. How do we do that through the, the platform of Jobonomics? Jobonomics deals with the, the economics of business, wealth, job and tax revenue creation. I've talked to uh, hundreds of mayors, not only domestically, internationally, just met with uh, the mayor of Mexico City and uh, a number of other places of that thing. And what I find is, uh, is that there is a complete un lack of understanding about how the economy works and jobs is, is, is only a metaphor. Yeah, the, we need to create businesses, create jobs. And uh, most of the mayors, most of the politicians don't do that. Eddie just said, uh, you know, they look at development because the development, the cities are a magnet for people that want work. And so to, to do the development is, is great, but after the development's done is the sustainability of the economy and the jobs and the businesses that, that, that they don't do that because most politicians tend to look at a very short term because they're only in for a couple hours, uh, you know, a couple of uh, years. They look and say, if I get a big mega project, you know, a, a football stadium, a skyscraper. So in Jobonomics, we found that most of the big cities are really interested in these, these big development projects. So we spend most of our time in the suburbs. You know, as Highland Park is to Detroit, or Seat Pleasant is to Washington, or College Park is to Atlanta, or Harlem is to New York City, we find out that the, the, the more peripheral communities are really, those mayors and those city councils are interested in building businesses, small businesses, and businesses that will not flee the inner city as things are imploding. Now things are imploding in the United States because you look at cities like Detroit. It's gone from 1.7 million to, to about a half a million people. And that's happening in the inner cities that they're decaying and they're demanding more and more services and more and more manufacturing that's not going to be coming in, in the near term. So we have to think of it differently on the 21st century jobs, whether it's how do you monetize the social networks, how do you put more women to work, how do you monetize uh, the waste streams, those types of things that, that are organic to the city that can provide new businesses that will sustain these developments. Joe, we're talking about uh, the population and of course there's many people saying we can't accommodate more people. We got over seven billion now and many people saying we've already stretched the limits of the planet as far as the natural resources and all that, yet they're going to be here. And so realistically we can't say well not going to have any more humans and uh, this is what we're going to take care of. So how do we develop these meta cities 
using the information from Chuck as far as the jobs and greeting it locally, Eddie as far as incorporating uh, natural landscapes, protecting soil, air, and water into these uh, new urban areas that are going to be here if we plan for them or not. They're well, going to happen. Well, the short answer is not going to be easy. And in fact, uh, Mother Nature is going to be part of the shaping uh, process. Uh, uh, people say uh, climate change is coming, uh, global warming is coming. Uh, the thing is, 25 million people have moved uh, due to a lack of water. And indeed, uh, I had the one uh, slide that showed uh, the amount of water uh, in relationship to the size of planet Earth. And uh, that's a finite resource. And uh, more and more people uh, are going to have to share that resource. And uh, in fact, there's a uh, brewing almost a war in, uh, between Egypt and Ethiopia about building dams and conserving water. So and this and this is true, uh, Joe, around the around the planet. And uh, we talk about the these uh, mega cities right. that we have now. Uh, supposedly, 195 of them are on deep uh, faults for uh, Category six to eight earthquakes. So this is that shaping I think right. you're talking about. Right. So so in other words. Uh, natural disasters, uh, lack of water is going to shape what we can do. But on the positive side, I think we really can uh, try to get the message out that all three of us have been uh, saying here this evening uh, to uh, a, a broader uh, group of uh, political leaders, of uh, economists uh, working with the World Bank. The World Bank has actually active programs working in this area uh, and it's going to take positive uh, leadership, uh, recognition of the problem, and also we're going to be shaped by Mother Nature whether we like it or not. Eddie, we are running out of time. Quick question for you and I'll have one for Chuck. How do we get the professionals to impact the policy uh, leaders and thinkers to break change, but do it now? Give me about 20 seconds, quick thought. We have to work in a coordinated fashion utilizing resources in our professions, like the American Planning Association, the American Institute of Architects, need to come together as a political leveraging force. Because a lot of communities throughout the world are saying, when is enough enough? As the quality of our health decreases because the quality of air deteriorates and so forth, more and more people are going to step up to the plate. That is what is going to make a difference, and that's what it's going to take. Chuck? What do we need to do as far as creating new jobs so we, we enhance the city, enhance the environment? We have come to real, have to come to realize that business create jobs. Government can create temporary jobs at businesses and at small businesses. And so we have to start a new mentality in the United States and around the world. What's happening in Egypt as we speak today with, you know, trying to depose a leader that's only been in there for one year is because of lack of businesses, lack of jobs. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, thank you for uh, being with us on the Emerald Planet. Joe, thank you for being here. Eddie, I'm going to reach thank across. You. And Chuck, how you doing, buddy? I'm going to reach across. Thank you for being with us as we look around the globe, and we're going to be creating.